Last week, we talked about going to Mars and the reasons why humans might want to explore into space. This week, we talk about the difficulties with going to Mars and what types of problems we will face when we get there. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. All right, so we ended off last week talking, you know, we, we sort of uh, came to a conclusion that humanity should go to Mars, if not for economic reasons or anything like that. For it, personal yeah, reasons. for personal for, reasons. Because we want to explore as humans. Right, B- because humanity needs to have a frontier to explore. So now we're going to talk about what, I mean, what was already said in the intro, how we're going to stay there. Now, here is the most obvious reason, which we we kind of uh, went into this last episode, but the obvious difficulty with going to Mars is that it costs a lot of money. And even if you are a billionaire and you wanted to see a mission to go to Mars, it it's very risky because there are, there are many things that can happen on the journey that can completely throw your billions of dollars away. So some estimates say that the mission to go to Mars will cost 10 billion, some say up to 20 billion, but regardless, it'll take a large investment from either some of the richest people in the world, the richest corporations in the world, or a large investment from a government. Well, luckily, that's already kind of happening with Elon Musk, you know, his pretty successful SpaceX um, company, also in combination with Tesla, um, is... Uh, he, he he's trying to propel humanity to Mars. That's his stated goal. Although we did mention Elon Musk before, but I would like to say that even if Elon Musk liquidated his company and he sold everything, he probably still wouldn't be able to afford the trip to go to Mars. Right. So it doesn't... Either Elon Musk needs to get way richer <laughs> or he needs some other billionaire government backing it. So that's that's what we're going to talk about, because whether a government or a billionaire would want to do this mission not only depends on whether it's worth it to do the mission, but how much risk is involved. And the amount of risk that's involved depends on what types of things could go wrong on the way that would pre- prevent uh, the crew from either performing their job or living. Right. Uh, living is a pretty important requirement for the crew who wants to colonize Mars. First... The issue, the the first big problem that shows up when you're talking about colonizing Mars is obviously getting there. Um, On a rocket, if you want to get to Mars, it's not like a trip to the moon, you know. But I think uh, we should have some realistic sense of how long it takes. I I think it's about a week to go to the moon, but... It takes about nine months to go to Mars, which which can be improved uh, based on the optimistic ev- uh, optimistic predictions about how good rocket technology will be over the next coming decades. Right. It could be as low as four months, but th- that's still but a long it's time. Still, it's still more than ten times as long as it takes to go to the moon. So things can happen in time period of months, as you can imagine. The biggest issue you could see with Mars, the transportation at least is that it's such a long time period that you need a ship that can accommodate people for four months without any access to even basic things like soil. You'd need to develop complex life support mechanisms to keep people, you know, supported for four months. And we do have some precedent for this because we have the International Space Station. Now, the International Space Station can always receive shipments and supplies that keep it alive but for the most part it's pretty much cut off from the rest of the world and it can't readily receive uh items that they need for their life support so borrowing ideas from the international space station may be very useful in developing a ship that can go to mars and sustain people for those months at a time right and i've heard people talk about the psychological problems with the trip to mars like oh four months on a spaceship how would that affect people psychologically? But I think you, you can see an example of that in the International Space Station. I think you know? it's my personal view that the psychological effects are blown out of proportion. Yeah. I don't think that they really impact the risk as much as people like to think they do. 
And the reason why I think that is because I, I personally have faith in humans, and this isn't this isn't just a, a kind of a baseless thing. People have been out on the oceans for uh, centuries, yeah. for months at a time. People have been in submarines Years during even war. Years sometimes. Uh, yeah, so the fact that people have done this before makes me believe that if you get enough highly trained people together, I think that uh, they could easily sustain a trip that's so monumental. And especially since the International Space Station, you know, sometimes has maybe like six people up there at once. I think, wasn't there a time where there was like four? I don't know, personally. All right. But anyway, there's not that many people up at the International Space Station at any given time, and none of them go insane, you know? it's It doesn't seem like a big psychological risk for someone to be on a spaceship with... Um, you know, a small band of other people for a long period of time. But I think the the next big issue comes in, and obviously we don't really have the technology that would get us to Mars yet. I mean, we could send a rocket to Mars, but sustaining a population of people, even a small one for that amount of time, needs some scientific development. Well, I think before we get into the colony itself... Uh, so we talked about the I issues with going to Mars and traveling to Mars, but even before they set up a colony, there are some problems, uh, there are some initial problems in, in setting up camp. I mean, camp before colony. Right. If you, if you think about it, uh, there are communications problems, for example. Right, uh, right. Now, every year, when, because the, uh, because the Earth and Mars orbit at different rates, there are different distances from each other. Right. So sometimes. So at some points, uh, we are very close, and at some times, we are very far. And because light doesn't travel at an instantaneous speed, sometimes it takes about three minutes for information from Earth to get to Mars, and sometimes it takes 22 minutes. Right. That's, that's the, that's the biggest problem with Earth's communication to Mars is those differing orbits. Because there's even, and this this happens with most robotic missions that have gone to Mars so far. Well, all of them. Yeah, well, all all of them. Uh, eventually, of course, a 22-minute uh, lag between sending messages is bad, right? But there's a period of time where Mars and the Earth are separated by the sun, and, and you cannot send communications back and forth, at least in a way that we know how. So basically, if that, when that happens, the Mars colony would go dark for up to a month. And it's possible to circumvent these issues, uh, but again, this delves into the economic risks associated. Because in order to fix a problem like that, the information blackout, you would need orbiting satellites around the solar system to help relay your messages, which would, of course, just require more money and would be more money down the drain if the Mars mission was unsuccessful. Well, now, see, I'm not sure you would need satellites around... Uh, at, at, at satellites you would need satellites the around the system. sun. Well, I don't. I don't think you need communication satellites because I'm not so sure that in that month you necessarily need to have that communication. I mean, you I, it would. It. I'm. I'm. Right. I'm saying it would only be necessary if you wanted communication with Earth constantly. Yeah. The no, thing I, with I think... having communication with Earth is that. As, as much as the people on Mars could be experts at what they do, if a problem goes wrong during that month, during that month blackout, and none of them know how to solve the problem, they will no longer have access to the expert knowledge that could be provided at Earth. Right. Of course, it's important to note this, in, this communication blackout only happens once a year. So theoretically, I mean, I'm obviously not an expert on Earth and Mars orbits, but um, theoretically, if you launched the rocket where it was where Earth was closest to Mars, which is when you would want to do it, right? I'm sure that by the time we've developed these technologies, we would be able to figure out the optimal time to send the ship to Mars that they could develop their small colony, you know, just just to test the waters on Mars. To and keep as they, much time before, before the, the information, information blackout. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Well, of course, but it'll happen eventually if you mm -hmm. wait a year, which also depends on how long we're going to have a colony here, which I think will get us into our next time or next topic here yeah. because it's about setting up camp versus colony. I think some of the missions that are planned to go to Mars uh, or speculated to go to Mars 
want them to go there, explore for a few weeks, months, maybe at a time, and then return to Earth. Some of them want to establish a permanent settlement on Mars, which but, is a completely different yeah. deal. I think, I think first, it, to me, it seems clear that first what you do is you test the waters on Mars, you send people there, you set up camp, and you send them back. Because... And of course, but then you have to pay for the return trip. Yeah. And then not only do you have to pay for the return trip, but if you later want a permanent settlement, then it requires another investment into Mars. At a time which maybe the public isn't as interested, you could use the moon landing as an, as an example, that we did go back to the moon, but we never, uh, we never developed the funding to create a permanent moon colony. We went to the moon and then came back, and it seemed like the public interest had died down because uh, we have a been there, done that type of attitude, and it, it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to mobilize the type of support and the funding if we've already done something similar. Um, I think it's a it's a little different from the moon because the moon is utterly inhospitable. I mean, setting up a moon base is very it, the moon doesn't have any natural processes on it that benefit humans basically at all i mean if you know it start, doesn't it doesn't really have know, an atmosphere if you want to start a lunar base you have to bring everything from earth you you can't rely on the moon at all you have to rely on earth whereas well, it's almost just setting up a colony in space it's exactly. just you get the benefit of gravity that's almost that's the only benefit the only benefit yeah and if you think about it the international space station is sort of in that same vein a space quote unquote colony in the sense that a mars colony would be a colony yes except the only difference of course being that we can't replace people that are on the colony once yeah. they're there they have to stay there unless we plan for some type of return trip which in that case it wouldn't be a permanent settlement yeah. this is what really matters with tyler and matthew on kowl 1490 the owl tahoe's talk Regardless what kind of trip you're planning to Mars, the first thing you have to do, obviously, is set up your, is set up your camp. Because, l let's be frank, as nice as it is that we have a planet that's semi-similar to Earth, Mars is extraordinarily inhospitable. And it is perhaps the most inhospitable place humanity has ever thought about colonizing. And so you can't just get off on Mars and uh, walk around and hope it to be fine. You have to have some type of uh, settlement, which could be in the form of a dome in which you could create your own atmosphere. Right. But I heard of something uh, that was very intriguing. It's that we, we find a cave on Mars. And the benefit of having a cave is that, of course, it's a natural settlement or a natural shelter. But more so than just being a natural shelter for us to create perhaps our own atmosphere within, if we sealed it off, it's better because caves can protect us from ionizing radiation, which ionizing radiation is one of the largest problems that humans have uh, going out into space right. because they Mars... can mess with our biological functions. Yeah, Mars doesn't have what we call a magnetosphere, which is the Earth's magnetic field. Earth is good for life because, you know, we have this magnetic field that protects us from the harmful radiation that the sun outputs. I mean, it's a nuclear reactor in space, you know? It's just sending out constant radiation. And that's bad for anyone who's standing on the Martian surface because... The Earth's magnetic field and the ozone layer, that doesn't exist on Mars. You're I, just getting bombarded by radiation wherever you are. And I kind of want to explain why radiation is bad in a biological sense. Right. So the way that ionizing radiation works, radiation itself is just photons. It's Radiation, for example, is uh, radio waves and microwaves and visible light. But the difference between ionizing radiation is that it's very high energy radiation and it can strip electrons off of atoms and can and can mess with the function and structure of molecules themselves which is very important because when it hits your atoms and your body then it can cause genetic mutations now as we talked about in our evolution episode genetic mutations are almost always a bad thing even though of course as we talked about in the episode they are the one of the drivers of natural selection they're generally a bad thing because they can cause cancer. They can cause other diseases such as uh, Huntington's disease right. and neurological diseases. And in fact, mutations within the human body can be seen as one of the main causes of death. In fact, it's, it's probably the main cause of non, uh, 
non-inheritable, non-infectious disease on Earth. So this would be amplified on a Martian colony because it means that if they were exposed to too much radiation, then the potential colonists wouldn't be able to live as long. They'd constantly be getting cancer and other forms, right, other exactly. diseases. You'd need to have um, uh, some kind of biosphere or a, a base in a cave that protects you from ionizing radiation. And then every time you left the Martian surface, every time you left to go on the Martian surface, you would need a suit that can fully protect you from ionizing radiation in the same way the Earth naturally protects everything inside it. Not in the same way, but, you know, you need to have your own personal shield from all of this radiation. And previously, like in the International Space Station, we use lead, or uh, we use metal shields. And these are useful at blocking some of the radiation, but astronauts have to accept the fact that they will live with heightened uh, sources of radiation for a year at a time. Yeah. But that's only because the longest at, or the, the longest we've ever been in space is about that, about a year. But when you're talking about a colony, even if they, even if they went to Mars and immediately returned, then the current estimate is that they would be in space for a year and a half, which is, which is basically longer than almost all astronauts currently. But that's, that's only saying if they returned immediately. If they stayed there for years or had a permanent settlement, this uh, would far exceed any previous uh, natural experiment that we've had about radiation on the effects of humans. Right. Those are all huge risks. Um, but the, the idea is that there will be some scientific advancements that will help us um, combat these problems. Of course, the next problem, even if you've dealt with radiation, even if you've dealt with the harmful effects of being in space for so long, and if you've dealt with the economic issues, you then have to deal with actually sustaining a colony on Mars, which, I will remind you, is basically constantly trying to kill you. I mean, Mars is incredibly inhospitable, even if you deal with the radiation. Yes. I mean, as we discussed last episode, it's it's very different from Earth in, in key significant ways. Yeah. But I think one way to just emphasize it is that we evolved to live on Earth. Earth is is suitable because we evolved to have the exact characteristics that could survive in our environment. But even though we evolved on Earth, we still live in houses, and we still have clothing, and we still have all these forms of technologies that help us live on Earth. We didn't evolve on Mars, so the types of houses and clothing that we will need on Mars will have to be far different. Yeah. One of the big ways that this that that this is different is because Martian soil, you cannot grow on that. We look at Mars and we see soil that looks kind of similar to Earth. It looks a lot more hospitable than the moon, and that's true. But the Martian soil is full of nutrients that that aren't compatible with Earth biology. And I think it's obvious that we will need to do some form of farming on Mars right. in order to sustain the food supply because they couldn't just bring food for decades. Now, some some people say you could bring up Earth soil and have that inside your biosphere, but that's heavy. That adds to the cost and weight of your ship. And you have to transport that to the Martian surface and hope that the nutrients in there are enough to sustain to self-sustain plant life. But there's another way to deal with farming on Mars. There's this small form of life on Earth that can survive conditions similar to Martian soil, simulated conditions. We found lichen and cyanobacteria. Now, these are things that you don't usually go around and think, well, this will sustain an entire Martian colony. Small bits of bacteria in the soil or small bits of lichen on rocks. It sounds insane. But cyanobacteria supports life, for example, in deserts, which are, you know, not very hospitable for life. They do something called N-fixing, uh, nitrogen fixing, which means they can fix um, nutrients that aren't compatible with life. They can make them compatible with life. Which, by the way, end fixing and creating nitrogen in the soil is exactly the reasons why most plants on Earth grow. And in fact, fertilizer, at least nitrogen-based fertilizers, use this to an artificial process. Instead of relying on bacteria, for example, to create the nitrogen in the soil, 
artificial fertilizers directly insert the nitrogen into the soil. So really this is, this is a benefit because it allows us, it allows us to get nitrogen, which is an essential nutrient for life into the Martian soil. Right. So that we could grow plants on Mars. So the idea is, instead of bringing up Earth soil, you take the Martian soil and make it Earth soil using these cyanobacteria. Obviously, you can't do this across all of Mars, but you can take samples of the Martian soil and convert it using cyanobacteria to usable soil that you could then grow plants in. You can also use cyanobacteria to create life support systems on the Martian colony. I think at this point, if we're talking about introducing life, which we are, yeah. uh, because we're talking about planting things on Mars, I think maybe we should talk about the implications and difficulties of introducing life to Mars. Now, right. at the moment, every mission that goes into space is required by NASA standards to be sterilized. Now, it's sterilized to an extent that they do have some leeway. They can allow some bacteria on missions because it's impossible to kill all of the bacteria. I guess in a way to relate it, those uh, sanitation agents only kill 99.99% yeah, of germs. Exactly. In the same way, NASA can only kill the 99.99% of germs on spacecraft when they release them into space. Now, why do they sanitize them at all? It's because we don't want to seed life on other planets. We don't want to make sure that we unintentionally put life on other planets, which could outcompete the life that might be on Mars at the moment. It's kind of like the prime directive in Star Trek. <laughs> now, the difference between this is that it's almost impossible to sterilize missions in which we're bringing life ourselves, which, uh, which by life, I mean we are bringing humans, which are host to trillions of microorganisms. So it means that unlike previous missions where we were at least uh we took precautions to sterilize the equipment now we won't be able to sterilize the equipment because as us humans we will inevitably release the bacteria that is on us onto the martian soil and we will have to deal with the consequences if there's life there if our life outcompetes it we might have we might later regret our decision because going there and making a colony was a mistake Right. Uh, but I think at the point you're colonizing Mars, you probably don't care that much about impacting Mars because you want to live there. No, I'm... but I'm saying that you might not care, but later you might regret it. Because it's a regrettable thing if you destroy the life that is there. Yes, uh, I mean, of course. But I, I think it's regrettable that you would destroy the life that's there, but at the point that you're creating a colony... You're really trying to make it suitable for humans to live on Mars in of course. one way or the other. I'm only talking about whether you would want to do that in the first place and whether you should take precautions and understand it uh, from a point of view of, will I regret this? Well, because I mean, in some I sense, think... and you could even relate this to past history. Now, when we, uh, when we colonize the New World... A lot of people at the time were saying, yes, this was a great thing, right? Because we're exploring the new world. And indeed, some of that is reflected in the modern day where people want to explore Mars in the same way that we explored the new world or Europeans explored the new world. But as an analogy, as a reflection of this, we introduced, for example, smallpox into North and South America, which wiped out almost all the natives in North and South America. So in that same vein, we could do the same thing to Mars. And so it's, it's, this is less of a difficulty for us than a difficulty of what will we leave? What will we leave behind? And will, are we willing to take that chance that we could destroy the only life that is on Mars? And I might disagree with you on that, but I think it is, uh, it is an important question to raise and it's an important question to ask. The philosophy of going to Mars and creating this world, taking this world and making it our own. Does humanity really have the right to do that? I would say so. I think maybe you would say no. And well, so I think, well, I don't know whether I would say no. I think that it's yeah. an open question and I would need to think about it more and I would need more uh, lines of evidence. But I think this is what we should go into next episode. We should talk about the moral, philosophical, legal, uh, sort of the more abstract and speculative reasons why not to go to Mars. And, and just implications, maybe that will lead us to a conclusion that we should go to Mars because of these moral and legal implications. Right. All right. So you catch us on the next episode of What Really Matters with Tyler Matthew. 
on KOWL 1490 The Owl to host talk. Goodbye. <laughs>